So as always, the patrons voted for the What the Hell is It video, and this time they chose Nimravis, which like, look at it. It's a cat. It looks like a cat. It probably sounded like a cat, but it didn't walk like a cat. Instead, it would have walked probably more plantigrade or nearly plantigrade. When you look at a cat's foot, they walk digitigrade, which means that just their digits and their toes and a little bit of the palm is touching the ground. Plantigrade means that the entire palm would also be touching the ground, so more like a raccoon, which it's kind of weird to think of a cat walking that way, I will be entirely fair. Now, while it may have walked plantigrade like a raccoon, it wasn't very closely related to them. And it was also slightly bigger than a raccoon, probably closer to the size of a caracal. And like caracals, it was probably hunting in a similar way, being very athletic and catching relatively small prey. But some of the other members of its group, Nimravidae, were doing some different things. And some of those features can start to be seen in Nimravis. For starters, some of them were simply just larger, like Hoplophonius. But Hoplophonius also has some interesting evidence that Nimravis also shows. And specifically, it seems like they bit each other. Not necessarily Hoplophonius and Nimravis, although that also does seem to be the case in one example. But it seems like these animals were pretty nippy, which leads us to the mouth where they had very, very large canines. In fact, they've been sometimes called early saber-toothed. And they're not directly saber-toothed cats. They are closely related, and we'll get to that. But this is something that we don't really see in most other mammals. For example, with Hoplophonius, there was a skull that was found by a seven-year-old in Badlands National Park that shows very narrow knife-like puncture wounds in parts of the skull. And that essentially just means it's the bite of another Nimravid. So they were at least biting each other in that genus. But also when you look at Nimravis, there is one Nimravis specimen called the Innocent Assassin specimen, where the skull is literally punctured through part of the scapula of another Nimravis. But it continues because there's also another Nimravis skull that seems like it has a bite mark from a Hoplophonius. So it's not just intergenera, but also other genera attacking members of different genera. Whatever was happening with these animals, they were pretty nippy. And we're not entirely sure why, but it probably has something to do with either predation, because Hoplophonius was much larger, closer to the size of a leopard, or potentially just territorial disputes. And when we start looking at those teeth in greater detail, Nimravis specifically is actually much closer to modern cats, but it still was a little bit longer than most modern cats. And that leads into the next part of it in animals like Hoplophonius, where they were also very, very thin and flattened teeth much like sabers that we see in later saber-toothed cats. And also the barbarophilids, which aren't cats but are closely related, even closer than the Nimravids are, at least probably. We'll, we'll get into that part of it. But this does mean that they were the first saber-toothed predators to show up in North America. And what they were doing and how they evolved can actually help us understand a lot about how other saber-tooths may have also evolved. Now, outside of the feet, which were relatively short and is part of the evidence we used to suggest they walked more plantigrade than modern cats, they were pretty much identical to modern cats in most other respects, with the exception of part of the inner ear structure not being covered by bone. So there's a very, very slight amount of difference. This does, though, mean that they were very closely related within the order Theliformia, which means it's not quite cats, but it's things like cats and hyenas and civets and mongoose mongooses, those animals, as well as a few other groups that are now extinct, like the Barbophilids and, of course, Nimravids. And as for that other extinct group, the Barbophilids, there's still a lot of debate as to whether they're closer to cats or whether they're closer to Nimravids. But if they are closer to cats, they're also one of the first groups to start to diverge from the cats that are very closely related to them. But that also means that the saber-teethed cat so things like Smilodon and Homotherium were also some of the earliest to diverge cats within Felidae specifically. And this all means at least some things about potentially how they evolved. And what it specifically means is potentially that all of these animals may have ancestrally all had saber teeth. And why I say this is because it seems like all of the early diverging groups, which should be the most basal and the most similar to the ancestral condition, all seem to have these saber teeth. So maybe some of the earliest cats also just lost those saber teeth. And this brings up an interesting point with modern big cats, because within the big cats, you have the genus Panthera, which is most of the large animals, 
things like leopards, tigers, and lions. However, you also have one outlier in the big cats, which is Neophilus, or the clouded leopard. And even just comparing its skull, which is much smaller to that of a lion, you can see proportionally, it has much, much longer teeth. So maybe this is all just evidence that suggests that the first ancestor of this group may have had long teeth and more saber-like teeth. But we don't really know that for sure just yet, especially since there's all of these other groups on the other side of the phylogeny, the things like the hyenas and civets and whatnot, which don't have saber teeth. So it's equally likely that either they ancestrally did have saber teeth and lost them in all of those groups, or that they all had short teeth and just a few separate groups evolved longer teeth later on. And these other groups also make it much more likely that they ancestrally didn't have long teeth. Because honestly, things like hyenas and the big cats have a closer node where they meet up on this family tree before the Nimravids do. And what that means is that it's far more likely that animals like the hyenas and the cats had short teeth and then some cats, specifically like Smilodon and Homotherium, evolved longer teeth. And then the Nimravids split off before that and also evolved longer teeth. Because hyenas and cats are closer related than things like Nimravids and cats despite them being visually very, very similar. And in the case of some of them like Smilodon and some of the Nimravids also had saber teeth. So a lot of really unique evolutionary ideas that could happen, but we really need more evidence to narrow down exactly what was happening. But there is still more evidence specifically in Nimravis brachiops, one species of Nimravis. And this is because it didn't have quite the same blade-like teeth that you might expect of other Nimravids. And so they were more conical and more made for holding, much more similar to modern cat teeth. And so this is why Nimravis is kind of within this interesting spot, because it still had relatively long teeth like the other Nimravids, but they went back to a more potentially primitive shape and something that is more similar to that found in modern cats, rather than the totally unique, more blade-like teeth that we don't have in any animals that are living today. So potentially these teeth are the ancestral condition and the ancestor of all feliforms didn't have blade-like teeth, but did have more conical standard teeth, and then Nimravids just evolved longer teeth separately. It's really hard to tell. There is another feature though that Nimravis has, or almost lacks, that most other Nimravids did have that help us know more about what they were doing more specifically, and that's very wide paws. Nimravis did have wide paws when compared to other cats. When you look at the graph that's given here, where it's tooth size compared to the overall paw width, you can see that Nimravis plots slightly larger on tooth size and slightly larger on paw size than most modern day cats. However, other Nimravids plot all the way at the top of this because they had much wider paws. And that does give us a hint about what may have happened. So while it doesn't seem like the Nimravids were directly related to any of the other saber tooths, they do help us understand what they were probably doing and they were probably all hunting in pretty much the same way using their large paws and apparently strong arms to pull prey to the ground and then use a precision bite with their saber teeth to dispatch it. And there's also other things that are suggested by Nimravis specifically. Because like I said, Nimravis didn't have those very, very long and blade-like teeth, but it did have some of those other features. Specifically, the paws were still somewhat wider and it still had some very specific arm anatomy that suggests it was good at grappling which if it's capturing mostly smaller prey, why would it need that? Well, I mean, if you're climbing a tree, you're basically grappling it. And this is really important when we look at modern day species, and in particular, one genus of modern day cat, because we see some of the similar builds in the forelimbs, including things like a slightly wider paw, as well as a low brachial index, which just means the length of the radius over the length of the humerus. And that genus is Neophilus, it's the clouded leopard which, as I mentioned, already has somewhat saber-like teeth. They're at least longer than those in other modern-day cats. So maybe this is just a snapshot of how these other saber-tooths evolved, initially being animals that lived in trees and were going from tree to tree. However, eventually they needed to live more on the ground, and they were able to actually succeed without the trees because their arms were already built to help capture large prey, making them more efficient as hunters than potentially some other species. And then as they were able to body down prey with their large and powerful arms, maybe they evolved these saber teeth just to deliver that precision bite. Because if you can kill the animal faster, that makes you more efficient as a hunter. So maybe this was an evolutionary adaptation for advantage 
in effectiveness of killing the prey and making it more speedy compared to animals like lions where they have to suffocate the prey slowly. Maybe it was that kind of evolutionary pressure that led to the saber tooth evolving in the first place. And of course, the clouded leopard is wildly endangered today because of habitat loss. And if they do end up needing to live on the ground more, who knows, maybe they'll go after different types of livestock, which would be unfortunate and bring them into more conflict with people. But if they're hunting on the ground more, who knows? Maybe things like saber teeth could evolve again. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. As always with the what the hell is it videos, the patrons voted on this. You can check out the description for, for the Patreon link. Um, I'm going to be out for a week doing geology stuff in the field, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to respond as much. I'm going to be looking at some racks. Yeah, nimravids are neat. Like, if I were to study mammals, I'd, I'd be down for studying nimravids. They're, they're pretty cool. With all of that in mind, the usual. Be safe, take care, wear a mask, get your vaccine, get that booster, get good, get healthy. Don't go extinct.